Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Miles Long from Cult of the Dead Cow, and I just wanted to introduce Mr. Uh, Steve Toplitz, a.k.a. Arrakis, here uh, from our Hacktivismo branch, who uh, has some nice things to tell you folks about this evening. Oh, yeah. Who are you kidding? All you suckers are in here for the free internet. <laughs> it's okay, you don't have to. Okay, so about four months ago, I was sitting in the doctor's office waiting, and it's a LASIK office. And I'm pretty upset and scared because I'm about to walk in and have somebody blow away tissue from my eyes with a laser my only pair of eyes, and then I'm going to be blinded for some amount of time. Now, I was pretty reticent going into it, and when the whole process was said and done, I was blind. And I was, my girlfriend took me home, and I was there sitting in bed, totally blind, listening to music, thinking about my situation. I've got bandages covered over my eyes, you know, some, some amount of blood, I'm sure. And I'm thinking, how did I get into this situation? What if I, I can't ever see again? And I thought, privacy must be a lot like this for people who don't understand it. You're blind. You're in a situation that's more complex than you can handle. It's a little scary. And it's better handled by people who know more about it than you do. It's typically one of those things that you don't do it yourself if you're average Joe consumer. So... You have to wonder, uh, while you're there, what's going to happen to be the outcome? And a nurse told me there's something called expectation management. And when she told me about it, I kind of thought I knew what it meant. She said, you can only get as good a vision uh, as possible if you're the perfect candidate. So you can't expect a perfect outcome. And so when I was sitting in bed thinking about privacy, that translated to, you can never have perfect privacy unless you're just in the perfect situation. And even then, there will be new exploits that come up, new threats. So it's unreasonable to expect perfect privacy. So that leads me to my next question. What is a reasonable expectation of privacy? Well, there is a legal stance on this, and there's two points to it. It's actually a test. Uh, the first one is, all right, hold on a second. I want to speak a little bit more about the privacy issue just for a second. Does this privacy end at your fingertips? I mean, is privacy just in your head? So what would constitute an inappropriate invasion of privacy? So back to the two-part test. The first half of the test is what uh, to have a reasonable expectation what is the reasonable expectation? And the second half is if society will uphold that expectation. It's reasonable to expect that a whispered conversation between lovers is private. And it's reasonable to expect what goes on in your own home is private. <laughs> it's reasonable to expect that your email and your documents are private. And prior to, uh, to 2005, it would have been reasonable to expect that your phone conversations and financial transactions are private, and perhaps it's still reasonable to expect those sort of things. While it's reasonable, those expectations are faulty because society increases in its failures to uphold what we find acceptable in an expectation of privacy. I'm not here to tell you that privacy is dead, but I'm here to point out where the bedrock of privacy lies so you don't build your house on sand. So I'll state it pretty clearly. You have no rights except those which you can forcibly exercise. Allow me to clarify that. According to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, you have the right to fly, uh, life, liberty, and the security of your person. You have the right to freedom of opinion and the expression thereof. You have the right to be free from arbitrary interference with your privacy. And I'll say it again. You have no rights except those which you can forcibly assert. This is the difference between a right and a law. 
A law only gives you consent to exercise a right you must already be able to assert. While I can't advise you about the assertion of those other rights I mentioned above, exercising your right to privacy will definitely go a long way to ensuring you don't have to. So how do you enforce your rights? First, we have to determine the framework that we're working under. Uh, we're a very mobile and interconnected society. Most of us have traveled here a long distance, and I don't think any of us have stopped communicating, talking, paying for things, going around, except, well, considering our present company, we may be doing so a lot more guardedly. Okay. In fact, I would say that we've probably increased in all those transactions for interconnectivity, and it's important to have the tools which properly match our behavior. Our behavior dictates that we need portable privacy. Portable privacy is that privacy space that surrounds you. It surrounds your home, it's with you at work, at the ATM, at a restaurant, and it's with you when you sleep. It's that zone which your own personal space uh, has, and it expands and contracts depending on your environment. It's the area that we have a strong expectation of privacy and that it's totally reasonable. But we must be willing to assert over it. Don't make any mistake, there is a war being waged for your privacy. And it's regardless of politics and it's regardless of the legitimacy of the intrusion. So this discussion is about maintaining that real estate. Some interesting devices have uh, been created to help you enforce your personal privacy space. Recently, Cult of the Dead Cow member Lady Ada released the Wave Bubble. Now, the Wave Bubble is a portable, uh, self-tuning, frequency jamming device. It essentially allows you to block out all frequencies, be it Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, whatnot, within a 20-foot radius of yourself. Pretty cool. Now, undoubtedly, it, it's a portable privacy device and a pretty cool one. One of the problems with it is that the FCC doesn't like it very much, and that's totally reasonable, but let's think about it for a second. The FCC declares that devices have more rights to intrude and permeate our systems than we have to deny those from entering our personal privacy space and blocking them out if we choose. So in essence, the FCC is saying these little electronic devices have more rights in that regard than we do. I happen to disagree. So I think her little device that allows you to create a black sphere around you, just totally devoid of usable signals, is pretty cool kung fu. One of the main risk vectors to portable privacy uh, is the same things you'll find in regular computing. It's going to be communications, your data storage, your transactions, and some of your computing environment. And there's solutions for each of these vectors, uh, however, they're uniquely different. They have to respect the principles of portable privacy, which are portability, elegance, and trustworthiness. Now, portability recognizes that the program itself has to reside locally in, uh, on the portable media or be accessible remotely uh, and executable remotely. This, isn't, uh, this is not applicable to simply having a program that can be stored on a USB drive and can install unless the program itself can uninstall when the program's closed and pretty much leaves no tracks behind. The second issue is trustworthiness. Now, we have to think about who are the people that are using these programs. They aren't going to have the same idea of trustworthiness that we will. Trustworthiness is a lot different than trust. Trust is something that you may have uh, explicit in somebody else. Trustworthiness is a property that you can evaluate. So trustworthiness is the principle of the program and privacy and the data handling it that can be trusted to some extent. And that degree has to be clearly stated by the program. Admittedly, trustworthiness is subjective to the user. If one has near theological beliefs about the software of the person who wrote it, then instead they've imbued it with trust instead of trustworthiness, and it completely bypasses the need for trustworthiness. Okay, for a program to be trustworthy, it should at least be source viewable, uh, if not entirely open source. For a program to be trustworthy uh, and open source isn't just enough. Just because it's open source doesn't mean that anybody's gone through it and audited the code. It could still have all kinds of things inside it. Take, for example, JAP. 
it still has a piece of code in it that allows people to track you if they wanted to turn it on. The importance of source viewability is not to prove that the program doesn't have malicious code, but to avoid the impropriety of appearing to have something to hide. If a program is closed source and the firm that's produced the software doesn't have a built-up trust in the mind of the consumer, then it creates a, uh, a disincentive for the consumer to actually use it. And incidentally, it also creates a target for the InfoSec community. Uh, the license of a program can also be important. Uh, many, it may impart additional security uh, to the program if one has a surety uh, in the reputation of the author. For example, GPL provides a uh, totally free software, but there are some other licenses out, out there that are pretty interesting as well. Take, for example, the Hesla license. It's put out by Hacktivismo. And what the Hesla license does is it allows you to put out a program and state that this program is pretty much open source except for you can't modify it to contain spyware, viruses, malware, whatever, or use it to uh, insert code and that could compromise somebody's identity. So in order to be uh, trustworthy, another property is the program has to fail securely. Bruchnir uh, succinctly described the issue as a system defaulting to insecure. That means if the system failed, we would have to uh, knowingly or unknowingly revert to a less secure system. For example, if you're running VPN that uses point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, uh, does the bitstream leak if the connection is suddenly dropped? The practical application of uh, failing securely would be typically to have an all-or-nothing situation. Either you get your connectivity and you get to where you're going, or it fails and it lets you know, know that it fails. So the upshot is when you open the browser you used it, did it get to Google? or did it fail securely and did it break and you didn't see anything and it told you that the proxy was refusing the connections. So another important piece of trustworthiness is, and it's perhaps the most important, it's knowing the level of privacy that's imputed by the program that you're using. Uh, if it communicates securely, is it anonymity? Is it privacy? Is it just plain encryption? Or is it a warm, fuzzy feeling? Okay, so, and other than the privacy aspect of it, you ha still have to be fully aware of uh, who their client is and if they have a very high political or legal risk in the environment that it's running in due to being incorporated in the U.S. or somewhere else. So uh, some commercial services, such as uh, FindNot, have design flaws in their anonymity systems, uh, relying on leaky protocols like SOX without forcing remote DNS lookups. And uh, it makes you think of, well, you should really be using another program like FreeCap or SoxCap or something else. The result is that while you're surfing anonymously, the websites that you're requesting are getting transmitted in plain text, and that totally compromises your anonymity. That's even worse than if you hadn't been using an anonymous uh, program at all, because you've got this false sense of security that you have some sort of privacy going on, and you may be more apt to do things that you wouldn't normally do, and you'd be exposing yourself that much further. On the other end of the spectrum is the Tor network. All right, this is a system based on onion routing. Onion routing is a uh, anonymization method where a datagram is wrapped up in uh, three layers of encryption and it's hopscotched across the internet and then it, where it goes out in plain text and then it's wrapped back up in uh, three le levels of uh, encryption and hopscotch back to you. All right, so when the final uh, layer of this three hop uh, is done, you get it back and it's pretty secure. You know that it hasn't been tampered with unless the exit node was playing around with the data. So I expect uh, we're gonna see some more rising of commercial anonymity networks uh, in the future. From what I've heard about, there's actually three or four commercial onion routing networks, but only one of them has actually been released to the public yet. There are a few more coming. Okay. Regarding elegance, never bef before has aesthetics and technology been so important. Uh, we recently saw one manufacturer start to really take it seriously. They religiously embrace the concept of elegance. So take, for example, the Apple iPhone. Why is such a device so captivating? I mean, sure, it's marketing, it's branding, and Apple fanboys have a lot to do with it, but none of the technologies in it are new or unique. A few people have mentioned that they combined all of these wonderful things into a single device, creating a multifunction device that's 
never been done before. Well, multifunction devices are the bastion of the uncreative. Convergence technologies have been the hype of marketing departments and the bane of sales ever since the advent of the radio alarm clock. You only have to look at monumental failure, the billion dollar monumental failure of AOL Time Warner to see that they can't combine these different things that don't necessarily fit together. We delude ourselves into thinking that if we have two devices and we put them together that they're somehow new, even if they don't complement each other. Well, the iPhone combines complementary devices by the fact that nobody wants to carry a cell phone or an MP3 player and a PDA uh, and a camera all in their pocket at the same time. You just don't have room. So what they've got in common is that they all work together in a single device and they occupy the same amount of space. This was an excellent idea of elegance. So it seems that they have to have really great uh, human computer interface. It exhibits the characteristics of being intuitive, easy to use, and self-contained. The technology employed within it is, you know, relatively transparent. You can't tell when you're switching it between it being an MP3 player or a phone or anything else. It goes on pretty seamlessly. You don't have to wait 20 seconds for it to load up. Another great thing about it is it's uh, got a single interface which can be used intuitively. And it's highly aesthetic with its intuitive touch screen. Portable privacy product design should also follow suit, and when they do, their success is amazing. The largest impediment to wide acceptance and employment in privacy tools is that they're spartan and crude in design. The most important principle for acceptance in the portable privacy tool, sad to say, is elegance. So having cluttered and mysterious or non-existent uh, interfaces limits the employment of the privacy tool to those who are either very privacy conscious or very technically inclined. So while that fits the definition of uh, most of us here, that is not going to fit everybody else because products live and die by the whim of the masses. So think about all those projects that you've seen that have gone nowhere. The information superhighway is littered with the carcasses of dead projects that died because they were in inelegant or difficult to use. So while you may have a great idea for your project, or you may love something that's coming out, Unless it can gain wide acceptance and it's very easy to use and it's intuitive, it's going to fail. So that brings me down to survival of the fittest. Most of these road kills were pretty incoherent and unrefined. And with survival of the fittest, we're aware that uh, if you're more aware of the plight of the panda rather than the Sega antelope, it should be more aptly named survival of the most beautiful. Due to the high level of integration required for portable privacy, the tools for enforcing your privacy have to be user-friendly and uh, as, as user-friendly as possible in order to get you to try them for the first time and keep using them. This means that they must not only be portable and trustworthy, but they have to observe the principle of elegance. So elegance contains qualities that are appealing, intuitive, easy to use, self-contained, transparent, and informative. Uh, it's, so things have to be appealing, they have to be aesthetically attractive. And to be intuitive, the use of the product uh, and its interface has to either be obvious by design or by previous familiarity. For example, Tor Park here, it looks exactly like Firefox, except it's got a few extra buttons added to it. And Mozilla did a great job designing Firefox. All right, to be easy, uh, to, be easy to use, it has to rely on little or no user input uh, or configuration. Einstein perfectly understood the idea of easy to use. Make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. So that means you can't oversimplify your controls. You have to know exactly what the user wants and meet exactly that, or as close as you can. Now, there's other areas where you may want to jump back in and add more, uh, some more configuration in the back, and that's fine, but make it so only the more technically inclined access that area, and the regular user doesn't jump into that area. Okay, it has to be self-contained, meaning that the program should be standalone. It shouldn't require any additional downloading or components or relying on pre-existing installations of certain connectivity software. Now, this isn't to say the operating system, because obviously you have to have that. Okay. To be informative, the software has to not only let you know that it's running, uh, but it also has to provide a status indicator of the privacy behind it. So. It has to be a color-coded icon in a system tray or a notification bar or something that lets you know that it is working. And I'll show you some software programs out there that are really great in their uh, design ideas, but in their implementation and their HCI, they're absolute nightmares. 
Okay, to be transparent is the greatest accomplishment of all. Transparency means that when you're uh, using the product, it's nearly the same as not using the product at all, except that you've got the conveyed benefits of the product. So with perfect transparency, you notice no degradation in your performance. You don't notice it getting any slower. Um, the reason you would worry about it getting slower is, let's say you've got uh, an anonymous browser product out there, and suddenly it's difficult to use or it, it doesn't always work all the time. You're more likely to switch it off and go without a condom and get yourself into a lot of trouble that way simply because, well, it was easier, it was faster, well, sorry, you just messed yourself up. And whose fault is that? Is that the user's fault? No, it's more of a, a design issue. Or the user has to know what to expect, or at least have options. All right. To exemplify it, let's take a look at the uh, Zero Bank browser that I wrote. All right, in the past year, this was known as Tor Park. I released it last November. Since November, we've had over 4 million downloads of it. I'd say that's pretty successful. It was published in 120 some odd publications. All right, so we're getting about 700 down, uh, 700,000 downloads of this a month. It's nothing novel, it's nothing unique, but what did we do? We took some pre-existing technologies that were already out there, capitalized on them, wrapped them up together, and made it super easy to use. There was nothing uh, novel or new about Tor, and we didn't go with a, uh, with a different network. There was Provoxy out there, which allowed you to take the socks and wrap it and uh, send it through Tor. Well, we found out that Firefox is capable of doing this right on its own. And we also uh, integrated Putty into it pretty seamlessly as well, so you don't have to deal with it or any windows. And I certainly doubt most consumers would want to deal with a, uh, a Putty shell window. Okay. So we have our framework for the ideas, and we know about our environment. Let's get to the current arsenal of digital armaments that we can use in this privacy war that's being waged against us. First, there's the field of secure communications, and let's break that down into popular groups. All right, you've got general communications, web browsing, email, chat, messaging, and voice over IP. Regarding your general communications, you have a couple of really great programs. The first is the Janus VM. Uh, that means virtual machine. Okay, essentially it's a virtual router uh, on your system and allows you to capture all your communications and by VPN it forces it uh, through the virtual machine and the virtual machine routes it through the Tor network. Okay, so the advantage of this is it's extremely transparent and allows you to view rich media like Flash and Java and JavaScript without necessarily compromising your anonymity out there because such programs can bypass your proxy settings and phone home normally. But when you're employing it by uh, VPN in the environment, that typically just doesn't happen unless they have some sort of special breakout. So that'd be an open VPN attack if they were going to make one. Okay, next we've got the Zero Banks XB VPN. This is a portable version of OpenVPN, and you can load it up on, uh, on your client software, and typically you have to connect to a server somewhere else. So if you have a server, that's great. If you don't, maybe you need to set one up at work or wherever you're working on. There's also commercial services out there that have uh, VPN servers, so you can just take this piece of software, use it as your client, put in your configuration files, run it, you're done. Okay. So the way uh, that it works essentially is that it allows you to push all your connections through a TLS encrypted pipe. So you get 128, 192-bit encryption, and it's pretty seamless and transparent. So suddenly, you were worried about your, your Skype program, you were worried about your browser and everything, but now you don't have to do any additional configuration. It's all wrapped up, captured, and pushed through the VPN. Of course, this doesn't exactly solve all your problems. You could still have a program that could be on your system and gather informative information about your local network and send that back through the VPN tunnel. But for the most part, this isn't a real threat because I can't imagine a whole lot of attackers finding use in finding out that my internal network IP is 192.168.0.100. Okay, we've got the Anonymizer's Anonymous Surfing, and that's the leading product in the field due to its excellent branding and maintaining a spectacular program design. All right, there's a portable version of Anonymizer that can fit on a U3 drive. All right, and it runs on both XP and 2000. This product nails both portability and elegance. The design is extremely transparent because it appears to use DLL injection to capture your outgoing traffic and force it through port 80. Um, that means that you don't have to change your browser, you don't have to pick between uh, Firefox or Internet Explorer or Opera, whatever you're using. 
um, it inserts itself between the browser and the network transmission and reroutes all of those HTTP and HTTP requests through Anonymizer. I've tried routing requests through it before that weren't necessarily the right traffic that should be going through and it still worked. This could be useful to you or not. I don't know exactly what speed Anonymizer is uh, pulling down. When I checked out their network, I was able to get somewhere between 200 and 400 uh, kbps. Okay. Now, Anonymizer is great on the elegance issue. It's great on the design. It's great on the portability, but it absolutely fails at trustworthiness. The service doesn't give any indication of the privacy offered, neither in their tools or their website. Uh, additionally, when you're using the service, the default settings uh, make sure that uh, you fail insecurely. In the default settings, alarmingly, I found out that when you download it and you run the program, that it doesn't even encrypt your outgoing traffic unless you explicitly tell it you want it to. I, I just couldn't believe what Anonymizer was doing considering the role of responsibility that they had placed themselves in as market leader. <sighs> okay, so... All right, another, uh, another aspect of Anonymizer is that it's closed source. That means that we don't know anything about the program and instead we have to rely on the author's own reputation. And it's not to say that the author doesn't have a great reputation, but we have no idea of what's going on in the program or the privacy level that it implies. Another problem is that Anonymizer is formed in the U.S. Now let's think about that for a second. What does it mean for a, an anonymity corporation to be formed in the U.S.? They're commercial, their commercial enterprise, and they're a single hub that exists. We don't know very much about their network at all. And that also means anytime they're exposed to a national security lever, let a national security letter, that they have to turn over the information. There's no question of, oh, should we or shouldn't we? The arm is behind their back, and either they're going to seize their assets and uh, shut them down, or they're going to turn you over. Now, we have a commercial anonymity network that we run out of a few different countries, and we've got one in a really high privacy jurisdiction, uh, you know, Germany, and we take things very seriously there. We've, we get somewhere about 50 to 100 requests per year from uh, courts and subpoenas and whatnots, and we get raided. Now, not one of our users has ever been compromised in that way, and we've been doing this for about six years, and we can show all our documents in the last 12 months of those attempted raids. You have to wonder about the claims that an anonymity service makes when they say, oh, in the last 12 years we've been operating, we haven't had a single user ever be compromised. And that's an ambiguous statement at best. What do they possibly mean by compromised? I was thinking that they would have to be operating under the assumption that they never provided any privacy or security at all in order to somehow convince themselves that that was the case. <sighs> okay. So the service doesn't give any uh, indication of the level of privacy offered, and neither do the tools in their website. One of the previous uh, administrators of Anonymizer had summed up their author as being uh, privacy for soccer moms. It's also thought that uh, whatever privacy it offers can be bypassed by leaky plugins such as Adobe Flash and Adobe PDF Viewer, which phone home. I haven't subjected it to tests yet, but I'm sure Stephen J. Murdoch, if he's out there, can tell you what happens. All right. Uh, the program itself is both portable and it's elegant, and the s but the service that it uses is crippled by the product, relying solely on the reputation of the developer, Lance Cottrell. Uh, that's because it's closed source, and as I said, we don't know what's going on with the network, and they're incorporated in the USA, so how seriously can you possibly take them? They say that there's not any risk, and it gives no indication of the privacy that it implies. Uh, but you're still banking on Lance Cottrell's reputation. And that's not to say that there's nothing going on there. Lance Cottrell has a great reputation. Uh, sometime about 10 years ago, he created uh, Mixmaster, the anonymous uh, remailing program. And that's pretty awesome. All right, but luckily for Anonymizer, these problems can be remedied by simply being more forthcoming about what's going on in their software, what's going on in their network, and perhaps telling the truth about what's going on with those national security letters and if they've been honeypotting this whole time. So the question is, are they going to do that? Probably not. There's a specific financial disincentive to do something like that. And considering that they've been around since 1996, we can say that the disincentive is substantial if the case is that they've had 
a national security letter on their desk every day saying, operate as a honeypot or else. And there is an incentive for them to keep going. It's something to the effect of, well, they get to keep the reputation in business and they get to keep collecting a hell of a lot of money. Okay. So the next portable privacy app that we've uh, got for browsing is uh, XB Browser from Zero Bank. It goes under many names and it went as Tor Park and Democracy Browser um, and it was designed by me. And it was originally based on the portable Firefox code. I designed it uh, from the bare bones of the program after being exposed to the sharp and treacherous learning curve of setting up a Tor client and a Tor server if you have no exposure to it at all. Okay. XB Browser is available for Windows. It goes all the way from 98, uh, I'm sorry, 95 all the way up to Vista. It should run on most versions of 95. Okay, uh, it, what it does is it not only runs on 95, but we've also gotten it running under Wine, and I think there are some copies that are running under Mac OS X, but no guarantees there. So XB Browser typically runs on the Tor network, and it's upgradable to uh, the high-speed zero-bank anonymity network, and I'll tell you all a little bit more about that in a second. So the, uh, the degree of elegance in XB Browser is pretty high. Uh, it's, got, it's a suite of programs that's uh, uh, Firefox, Tor, and Putty, but it transparently operates uh, through a single program. It's just a wrapper. So the program is intuitive since it's designed and behaves mostly like Firefox, and as I said, Mozilla did a really great job with that. Uh, the program is easy to use. It's pre-configured uh, for direct internet connections. But if you're operating behind a firewall or a proxy, it'll pop up a notification saying, hey, we had some trouble connecting. Uh, do you want us to try and auto-detect your proxy situation, or do you want to enter in your credentials right now? Okay, so that's... That's pretty good. The product's informative because when you're using the Tor network, uh, it tells you the user status. Uh, it tells you if Tor is on, if Tor is off. It tells you what's going on. And it also fails securely, meaning that if for some reason you can't connect, it's either because the Tor network's slow or a server is unresponsive, or alternatively, you did something wrong and it messed up and you broke it, which is a good thing. You don't want it to keep going. Okay, so we had a lot of users complaining. I mean, we had, we suddenly opened up shop and overnight we had 500,000 Chinese download the program, another 500,000 US and Europeans download the program, and a lot of them complained, oh my gosh, what is going on? Suddenly the network is unusable. And that's not to say anything bad about Tor, but when you suddenly get uh, an exponential increase in people suddenly using the network, and you have a limited amount of resources that didn't scale up with the network use, you're going to see some uh, loss of connectivity there. So about the 10,000th uh, request I had for what can we do to speed it up, I thought, well, you know, there's, there's probably some tweaks I can do. I can uh, distribute maybe a, a directory of long-lived nodes within the set itself. But I don't know. I, that probably wouldn't work. So after they asked me, I thought, well, there is something that we can do. We could create a private anonymity network out there that was specifically made to, for to be broadband speed. Okay. Now, regarding the Zero Bank network, it allows you to surf anonymously at those broadband speeds we talked about. And I say anonymously because we've blinded ourselves from the identity of who our client is. When somebody signs up and they pay us, even if they pay by credit card, we have absolutely no idea who they are. All that we get is a uh, transaction ID. That's what the user gets, um, and it's assigned for the payment. Once the payment goes through, that transaction ID, which is totally not associated with any customer information, which we don't have, by the way, that uh, transaction ID corresponds to an account, and we flip on the account. And it depletes for the certain amount of time that the person bought the account for. Okay. So what we've got are a couple of different networks out there. Uh, we have an SSH network that'll give you between 200 kbps and about a half a megabit. Uh, we've also got a VPN out there, and that'll give you anywhere between one and a half megabits all the way up to about six megabits. And most of the servers are located in Germany and Austria. Some are located in Southeast Asia. Some are located in South America. I can't specifically say where, um, but we'll get to that too. Okay, the amount of programming that had to go through it uh, was pretty horrible. I wrote the program originally in Insys because that's what the portable Firefox was written in. And it was terribly easy to use, I admit, and I, I should have probably rewritten it in Python. 
So we've got this uh, program out there that was written in Insys, which is just an installer language from Nullsoft. And it was never meant to do the things that it does, but luckily it does them and it still works. And it, it's probably leaking memory somewhere. We'll see. We'll find out. But inherently, that's going to be a problem with Windows. Because let's take, for example, we can turn off Firefox and tell it, don't keep a cache, uh, keep your memory small, and whatever. But at the end of the day, if we get memory and it fills up more than the memory it's supposed to allocate or Windows feels like it, it'll s suddenly take that memory and write it down to the cache. So you've still got it somewhere existing on the hard disk. So unless your system is you know, so great that you're, you're wiping out all your free space and you're clearing your cache file at shutdown, you're not going to be totally in the clear. And it's not as though the uh, program can withstand forensic analysis. If you run it on a computer, somebody's going to know that, uh, you know, Tor Park or XP Browser was actually run on that computer. But that's not an attack we're trying to defend against. Typically, it's going to be somebody who needs to walk into a internet cafe, uh, plug in their program, and suddenly they're surfing the internet anonymously. Okay, so we have the network services that the uh, XP browser uses. First, let's take a look at Tor. Tor is a distributed trust model and advanced algorithms for uh, routing and uh, balancing. It's totally open source and licensed under the three clause BSD license. So by default, Tor servers don't create logs. And thanks to the fact that it's uh, run under, uh, it's run on donated bandwidth, anybody can participate. And it's physically distributed across multiple jurisdictions, so it has a low legal risk. Um, and it has practically no financial risk at all because it's just people running it from donated bandwidth. All right. Another great thing about Tor, and this probably isn't stressed enough, is they have extremely close ties to the pro-privacy and extremely litigious EFF. So that helps them out a lot. One of the inherent problems with Tor is that you're trusting all of the exit nodes and all the plain uh, text traffic that you pass through, the exit nodes get to see. And they can modify it or change it if they wish. Now, let's think about that for a second. What does that mean? That means that if you're using it, you're using XB Browser and it's going through the Tor network, you're putting your trust in the very last person who's running that exit node. They can see everything that you do and everywhere you go online. And it's possible, unless you're running end-to-end -end encryption, that they could turn around and insert uh, some bit of malicious code in there. I've heard of other uh, types of SSL certificate attacks, but that's really not what the talk is about. This is a little bit more high level than that. OK. So one of the problems is that Joe Nobody decides to be a, uh, a malicious guy, and suddenly he could be sniffing your traffic for logins. It's a great place to hang out if you want to sniff people's traffic for logins and credentials and financial information if they were just, you know, they didn't know what they were doing. And an unfortunate part about that is XB Browser makes it really easy for somebody to accidentally use it and not entirely understand the environment that they're operating in. So there are inherent risks with making software really easy to use because you're creating a powerful tool and putting it in the hands of somebody that doesn't necessarily know how to use it. OK. So while the Tor network is an excellent project with low political and legal risk and it's extremely trustworthy, nothing can over overcome the fact that it's often excruciatingly slow. Now, eventually, this will change over time, and it'll definitely speed up as uh, the designers concentrate on efficiency of the bandwidth usage. But regarding portable privacy and the aspects that it's got to address, it fails in this regard. And it's not by any fault of the Tor network itself, but the specific failing of it is the transparency. The transparency issue is that if it becomes too slow or the circuit becomes faulty, somebody's likely to stop using it entirely. And that's just not a situation that you want to have. OK, so because of this problem, XB Browser is upgradable to the Zero Bank network. All right, the Zero Bank anonymity, uh, let's evaluate the trustworthiness of it for a second. I personally think Zero Bank is the greatest thing since sliced bread, but I'm biased because I'm an administrator at Zero Bank. OK. So the software that ZeroBank uses uh, for their network is open source, and it's mostly GPL. And it includes uh, an SSH interface and a TLS VPN interface. The ZeroBank network doesn't log user activity unless the user has specifically violated our terms of service. And in most cases, we'll just take that account and we'll shut it off. ZeroBank networks are all their machines are running on encrypted disks in different jurisdictions. We've separated the 
user information, such as the account information, from the actual machines that are running the communication servers. All right, additionally, those systems are also segregated from each other and they get audited on a regular basis. The only people that have uh, access to those, they've got access by uh, key login only. And the people that have access are the administrator for that server, the CSO, and the auditor. And after the auditor comes in and checks everything, the keys get changed. And what the auditors do is they report back to the CSO and say, okay, our admins of those communication servers aren't doing anything malicious. So what that does is essentially solve the exit node problem. The problem being, how do we know that people aren't monitoring our exit node traffic? Well, we know that we're not logging and we even check our administrators to make sure that they haven't bugged the communication servers to uh, monitor all the outgoing traffic. Okay. All of our servers are distributed across multiple jurisdictions and they don't log any personally identifying information and they're pretty secure. So legal risks are relatively low because Zero Bank is owned by Torify LLC, uh, which is incorporated in offshore in the sovereign and privacy state of Nevis. Uh, a Nevis LLC is relatively difficult to assail and conquer because it doesn't recognize judgments from the US or the EU. On top of all of this is the crown jewel, the Zero Bank Client Secrecy Guarantee. The, C, uh, the CSG states that uh, ZeroBank has a contractual obligation to protect the privacy and identity of users against illegitimate demands for information. So because ZeroBank is an international business, it has to decide for itself uh, what, a st what the standard of a legitimate claim is. That standard is the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Thank you, Hacktivismo, for giving us that great piece of information. Okay, so what that means is if suddenly we get a subpoena from a jurisdiction like it's China and they say, um, we would like you to turn over the information of the user XYZ for purpose, whatever. We first look at that and think to ourselves, okay, we don't even have this guy's information and we don't have his traffic. And second, that's going to be a pretty tall order because then we'd have to reverse our own systems, go back and try and find out who it is that's connecting through what account. And even then, we don't have the payment information to figure out who paid for this account. If they paid for it by eGold or some other anonymous method, uh, we, we would have to implement a live trace and somebody would probably have to be holding a gun to our heads to do it. So when we get an order from the U.S. stating, listen, this is a matter of national security. We want to know if he was at the yogurt shop Friday night. Sorry, guys, that's just not going to cut it. Now, there's a few other things that we have to take into consideration here. Um, there's some other browsers that we should mention, and I don't have a whole lot of time to continue this talk, so they decided to give me 45 minutes, so let's go with it. All right, there's the uh, Maxthon browser for Windows, and that runs on uh, U3 drives. It's pretty great, and it's extremely popular in China. Supposedly, they have 90 million downloads, and it's totally possible for them, for them to start using this. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have uh, any privacy settings yet and doesn't have any anonymity, but if somebody was really inclined to make a project out there, you could sure get a lot of users real quick. All right, another program out there is Ghostzilla, and this uh, program gets an honorable mention. All right, Ghostzilla is portable, and when you move your mouse away from it, suddenly the screen you were working on disappears, and you have to move your mouse back and forth to make the window reappear. Well. It's, it's pretty cool, but uh, and it's entirely trustworthy, uh, but it's got an inelegant design and Ill inelegant interface because it's just a portable version of an old Mozilla browser that's honestly not that great. Okay, another web surfing program out there is Browsar. Browsar gets a dishonorable mention. Browsar, uh, the website purports to be a, uh, a, a the, the fastest download out there for anonymous browsing and it's secure and whatnot. But to be honest, they tiptoe around using the word secure. They use the word secure uh, very infrequently because it turns out that Browsar is simply a wrapper for Internet Explorer uh, that puts on a cool little skin and clears your cache when you shut down, when you close the browser window. Wow, that's not exactly uh, what they told us. Okay, next on our list are the email clients. All right, there's uh, Portable Thunderbird, which is uh, a special, it's just a copy of Thunderbird that runs on your USB key. Uh, it's really great because Thunderbird out, uh, it has LDAP for your servers uh, in case you have an address book stored elsewhere and you don't want to uh, store your address book on your local machine. So if your machine's compromised, people don't know who you know. 
It also supports uh, TLS and SSL. Uh, it supports IMAP, so if you want to have an offshore server where you keep your mail, like we do at ZeroBank, then suddenly anybody who gets your browser and doesn't have your master password, they can't get any of your messages. Okay, let's go on to uh, Mobility Mail. Uh, for Mobility Mail, it's just another version of uh, Thunderbird, except it's got an Mail, which is a plugin that allows you to have uh, GPG uh, encryption and decryption in the program. So suddenly somebody can send you a message with PGP encryption and with a single click and a password later your message is decoded. What does this protect against? Well when you send a, an email out over the internet, as most of you all know, it's like writing something on the back of a postcard. You don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy. So what you do is you employ this encryption on there and suddenly you've got something pretty high level that if anybody is a casual observer they can't figure out what it is you've said except if you put it in the title of the email itself. Okay. Now we've got the uh, instant messaging. All right, what we've got in instant messaging currently consists of uh, IRC, which uh, involves discussion channels and one-on-one -on -one messaging, which most of us know as uh, instant messaging. Um, but IRC anonymity is dead for the most part. Okay, uh, what took the place of that is uh, SILC, and there's a wonderful new program that we're going to get at that runs SILC and a host of other programs. Uh, I'm sorry, protocols. Okay, it's Pigeon and it runs a small uh, little add-on called Off the Record. All right, uh, Off the Record allows people to have uh, AES encryption in their chats. It uh, supports a gazillion protocols out there, and it's also got port perfect forward secrecy thanks to using Diffie Hellman key exchanges. Okay, some of the main risk vectors to uh, portable privacy. Um, are what we've discussed, but uh, an, another bit that we need to talk about for just a little bit are cash. Now, in the coming age of digital privacy, we're going to have to be spending a lot more money online, and there's systems out there that we need to be aware of. There's regular normal digital currencies. There's uh, somewhat uh, like PayPal, where they know exactly who you are. There's Nimbus currencies, where uh, they're somewhat blinded about who you are, and that's like eGold, where you could have a numbered account that it doesn't necessarily correspond to you, where they don't exactly know who you are, or eBullion. And then there's upcoming currencies like Loom and eCash, which are totally anonymous, uh, and they, they both use slightly different methods. I know eCash uses uh, Shomian tokens that they've blinded themselves from, and they've, got, they've currently got a central operation that they run inside the Tor cloud. Okay, that gets us back to um, computing environments. All right, we've got the uh, Rocket Live CD, uh, Anonymity Anywhere, Incognito, and the new XB machine, which we've just released yesterday. Now, uh, I don't have much time, so I won't even cover those, uh, those other ones at all. I'll move right to XB machine. Uh, the current winner, though, I think, is the Incognito Live CD. That means that you can boot from it and suddenly you're anonymous and all of your connections and software are anonymous. So we're introducing today the uh, XB machine, and that's available from the Zero Bank website. All right, it runs on, uh, it'll run on QEMU and it'll also run on VMware. And it's got a uh, private network information only, meaning that it's going to have a really hard time trying to compromise your anonymity even if it wanted to. The interfaces are all firewalled on it and it's a hardened version of uh, Gintu. Uh, the clients that it runs for the anonymity network are Tor, the Zero Bank SSH connection, the TLS we talked about. Oh, and I see we've mentioned the Zero Bank onion routing network. Okay, this is uh, more of what the structure of the program looks like. Um, as you can see, we've got all the programs uh, in one area, and the anonymity and the hardware are running on one instance, and then uh, on an encrypted partition running loop AES that also has a self-destruct uh, key that you can put in are, is where all of your private data is kept. And once you enter in that self-destruct key, all of your settings are suddenly wiped out, obliterated, and unrecoverable. And uh, for for your own appreciation, you could do that if you wanted to reset the system and it'll recognize that. So it's got all of those wonderful programs that you wanted in it. It's got Firefox, it's got Thunderbird, it's got Pigeon with Off the Record and all the wonderful things that we discussed. And eventually it's going to have uh, anonymous wallets uh, on there for anonymous digital currencies. So suddenly you're going to be James Bond loading up this CD or this uh, virtual machine anywhere you are and suddenly you're totally anonymous. And the great thing about this is it follows all of the principles of portable privacy. It's totally transparent and easy to use. It's really fast. It's upgradable to the Zero Bank network as y'all are about to see, and it's got fantastic security. We spend about 400 hours hardening the system. Now, we're not done entirely. It's still got its own flaws, but let's take a look at what it looks like. This thing is 
pretty easy to use. It looks so simple that even a Windows user could directly plug in and start using it. That means that we're going to get a high amount of people who are willing to use it entirely. Okay, so it comes pre-configured to use the Tor network, or you can shut off your network connections, or with a single click you can upgrade to the Zero Bank network, and suddenly you're browsing anonymously at, you know, six megabits. Good for you. All right. Now, XB Machine isn't perfect. It's got its own risks, and some of those risks we'll get to, but this is just a pre-release that we've released now, and you can download it from the Zero Bank website, and I'll give you the... Uh, the address for it now. It's not a live CD currently, it's just a virtual machine. Uh, eventually we're going to put it into a live CD to allow you to boot from it as well. So what that does is it not only addresses the software problems that you had to deal with before, but now it'll address almost all of the, uh, the operating system and computing environment problems that you would have dealt with. Your risks now, other than the, those listed, are going to be somebody looking over your shoulder or somebody's got a hardware key logger. And there's probably something else we're going to add is a software, uh, a software keyboard to the login mechanism, just in case. Okay, so you can download it at this address, or you can surf over to Zero Bank and uh, click on the drop-down menu and go to the Zero Bank, uh, the XB machine drop-down. So once you get that, it's about a 370 megabyte download, and you can run it from VMware, or QEMU, or whatever you like. Okay, some of the other things that uh, Hacktivismo asked me to mention before we pass out the free accounts are we're starting two new programs. One of them is Gulag, and Google's about to find out about that the same way that Microsoft found out about Back Orifice. I had a talk with a Google security person yesterday and let him know that uh, there's a new dragon coming. Okay, another thing that we uh, we wanted to make you all aware of and just let you all know before I'm cut off here real quick is uh, you all heard about Yahoo probably and about a year ago they uh, they shut somebody off and had uh, they had the guy, they took the guy out and he got imprisoned for 10 years for saying something the government didn't like. Well, we're coming up with something else for that. So if you all know anybody out there or know anybody who knows anybody out there that's been affected by Yahoo or Cisco or Google or anything like that, I urge you to contact Hacktivismo because we would definitely like to know. We're uh, coming up with a uh, documentation paper on it and we'll be having a project following up on it. Okay. And that ends our discussion.